Hi, I'm Tiffany. And as Kira said, I own Ready Creative. We work with homeowners who are moving walls, changing out finishes, and building new spaces. We also work with commercial food and beverage clients where we imagine how to convert something old into something new or how we can take a new blank slate and make it uniquely their own. I work with one other designer, Elena. Elena, please stand up. <laughs> She's my, my other half. <laughs> Get closer to the mic. Ooh, okay. Sometimes we work out of my, out of our showroom space behind my home, which is surrounded by my large fruit, vegetable, and flower garden. So those are all of the things that you either already know about me or could find out on Instagram. <laughs> what you may not know is that I hate public speaking. <laughs> I always avoid it. Even speaking up in groups is something I've struggled with. Despite having a lot to say, I don't gravitate towards sharing my thoughts and opinions. As my friend Mia says, I like to keep it low key. <laughs> so it's taken a lot to get me up here. <laughs> Writing this talk was hard. It was painful. And the closer we got to today and this moment, the less I wanted to do it. I didn't want to accept that it was really happening or that I had gone against everything I know about myself in order to do it. And the question is, why? <laughs> and the answer is, of course, acceptance. I actually wrote two and a half versions of this talk. I got eight minutes into the first one and decided there was no way I was getting up and going to say all of what I wrote. I got 12 minutes into the second one and realized I needed to change it again. I wrote a third, and this is part of that one. <laughs> Acceptance is a heavy word. For me and for most people, acceptance has always been a struggle. Accepting reality, accepting things I cannot change, accepting the facts of a situation, accepting that even when I feel something so strongly, things simply aren't as I want them to be. On top of this, the search for acceptance from everyone else and the acceptance of myself, who I am, who I want to be, the possibilities of who I could be, it weighs on us. I'm a person who has always felt out of place and also someone who grew up with the understanding that I wasn't good enough, I wasn't the person I was supposed to be, and I'm still struggling with that. I'm still accepting my trauma, and I'm still accepting how it shaped me and how it shapes everything about us. I have the kind of childhood trauma where it's not even that I only question my decisions, but first, I always question the emotions around my decisions, not what they are, but are they valid? Should they hold any value? Are the feelings of my parents worth more than the feelings of my own? When I know they don't accept me, are my feelings worth enough to make choices I may not want to make? And are they worth making choices I do want to make, but know I shouldn't make? I'm sorry, my nose is running. <laughs> We all craft who we want to be perceived as. While I would describe myself as an extremely emotional person, that is not how others see me. While I come across as level-headed, I'm an over-calculator. If I'm going to share my opinions, I need to know that they're, how they're going to be received. I need investment, trust, the reassurance that the person I'm speaking to is open to hearing what I have to say. So how do I assess that? I do a lot of listening. I listen for acceptance and then I speak. If I don't hear acceptance, I don't, which is maybe why I've been told that I can come across as intimidating. If I'm quiet, it's because I'm still searching for acceptance. Searching for acceptance is how I got into my current interior design role. We all have moments of acceptance. These moments can last literal moments or they can last for years. They are quickly followed up by moments of choice, which can last for seconds, or what feels like continuous moments of choice derived from one moment of acceptance. Here are a few things that I had accepted about myself by the time I was able to make some of my own choices. One, after going to a private all-girls school very close to here in Baltimore since second grade, 
I knew that I was not a good student. I had a lot of anxiety and didn't perform well on tests. Two, I did not want to go to college. I didn't have parents who were talking up their college years or really telling me much aside from that I had to go. I didn't even really understand how I could get in. Three, I started taking art outside of school in middle school and it was the thing I knew I was good at. So I always thought I would go to MICA, but my parents said no to that because they didn't want me going to art school. In 11th grade, I started applying to art programs at liberal <laughs> arts colleges, really only two because that's how badly I didn't want to go, and simultaneously accepting that I was going because it was the ticket out of my parents' house. So how did you choose a school? Both of the ones I, att I attempted to apply to seemed fine. Both had good graphic design programs, nice campuses, and generally friendly kids. Both were close enough to still drive home, but also felt far enough that I knew I wouldn't be expected to visit often. So how do you choose? At 17, I chose based on the nighttime activities the students took me to during my overnight <laughs> visits. One group of students took me to a diner to hang out. The other students took me to an off-campus party. Diner life wasn't something I was willing to accept. <laughs> so I went to Syracuse. And when I arrived, got settled in, and said goodbye to my family, I was the happiest I had ever been. The acceptance I experienced was on a level I had never known. I felt free, which opened my eyes to all of the other things I hadn't even considered accepting about what I actually wanted, what I could do with my life. But it also opened my eyes to the possibility of who I could be. My sophomore year, I declared advertising as my major, and one semester in, I realized that writing ads wasn't for me. Here I was dealing with what felt like a failure and feeling kind of disappointed with myself for not being able to stick it out. I was worried that my parents would not want me to switch majors, and overall, that despite my struggle with the work, I should accept that this school would also be hard. I legitimized my switch to computer graphics because I wanted to go work for Pixar, who by then had produced Toy Story 1 and 2, and had brought about the greatest form of illustration we had all ever seen. I could never have imagined that animation would be a choice for me, but I was making it. In graphics, we were required to take computer programming. We also learned Photoshop, Illustrator, and some of the other Adobe programs that no longer exist, like Dreamweaver and Flash. <laughs> all good, all fine. I really enjoyed it. But while I was in graphics, I started missing the photography classes I had taken in high school, so I decided to enroll in all of the photo classes I could. I was told I wasn't allowed to take the senior thesis, which also meant I couldn't officially double major. This I decided to accept, I think because there was just a lot going on. To put it in perspective, this was my sophomore year, and during Thanksgiving break, my parents moved to Minnesota. This was two months after 9-11. I mention this for a few reasons. I flew home from Syracuse and remember being fairly afraid. Ate dinner the next day and for the next two days of break, traveled in a car to Minnesota from Maryland and then flew back to school on Sunday where I developed my first trauma from flying. I was in the back of the plane and if you've ever flown from the Midwest, you're aware of the turbulence. <laughs> but I, an East Coast and only once overseas flyer, was not. So I'm in the back and we're bumping around and the flight attendant's in the aisle right next to me while well, she falls and she screams. And that was the day I accepted that I did not enjoy flying. <laughs> By the time I was back on the ground and was considering a dual major, that no just didn't hit the same. So I stuck with graphics and a lot of photo and a lot of parties, and I still love school and in a way that I hadn't really expected to. I absolutely loved learning and finally felt like I was doing well. One of the other things I loved was decorating my room. Growing up, I was never allowed to do this, really. We had a boring house, white walls, beige carpet, then we moved and we had hunter green carpet, and in all of that time, I was never allowed to paint my room, hang posters, really anything more 
then hanging framed art was not allowed. So when I would get stressed or bored, I would rearrange my furniture. This experience came in handy when I got to college, and obviously much later, because after that first dorm room where I covered every wall with posters, lights, tapestries, photos, and anything else I could get to stick to cinder block, I started really getting into different ways I could arrange my dorm rooms while also giving them a whole vibe. I was that girl with the blue twinkle lights whose room looked more like a hookah lounge than a dorm room. <laughs> By my junior year, there was an undeniable maximalism situation. <laughs> and someone said to me, why aren't you studying interior design? The truth was that I hadn't even considered interiors. I had accepted where I was, but once I looked into it, that all changed. Graphics was fine, but interiors, that was where I was supposed to be. So once again, I considered changing majors. I could transfer to interior design at Syracuse, but those students were in a five-year program. And to join, I would be at school for at least two more years. I couldn't accept that. I couldn't shake the idea of not having my friends around and living in the tundra for two more years. So instead of switching majors, I attempted to bring interior design into graphics. The summer after my junior year, I did an internship at an architectural firm. It was a lot of 3D modeling of their new office and not a lot of architecture work. And I returned to school ready to do more 3D interiors, which I did. And in that new age of real estate house walkthroughs and HGTV models, <laughs> I thought that I could get a job somewhere when I graduated. But that didn't happen. Instead, I moved home to my grandmother's house in Maryland, where I was told that I needed an interiors degree to get a job in interiors. Why didn't someone just tell me then to start a business? <laughs> to not accept my reality, like so many people now who love design but have no education are doing. Because it was 2004, and my grandma's house still had dial-up. The iPhone was not even a thing. No one had followers. So I accepted that I needed to go back to school. But how and when? I had no idea. So I ended up moving to South Florida, where my parents had moved during my junior year. I hated it there and <laughs> spent the first months figuring out how to leave. But in the meantime, I started accepting my fate. And I got a job as a showroom designer at a furniture store. I actually enjoyed showroom design. and. Then I got laid off during the holidays. <laughs> I actually got a job in graphics after that, working on luxury real estate magazines, but then they moved the art department to Ohio. I then got a job as a waitress, which gave me a lot of free time to research schools. <laughs> I started dating someone who happened to be from Rochester, New York, just an hour from Syracuse. So when I started applying to grad schools, I applied to RIT, you know, just in case. The other school I applied to was GW, and I felt pretty excited when I got into both. But I wasn't sure where I would end up. When the guy I was dating proposed, we decided to move to Rochester in July of 2007. In August, I went to register for classes and found out that the graduate program I applied to didn't get reaccredited for interior design. <laughs> RIT offered me another bachelor's degree, which I didn't want, and I accepted that I had to leave if I wanted to pursue a graduate degree. So I got in touch with GW and found out that I could start in January of 2008. I did end up taking some classes at RIT, furniture history, woodworking, architectural modeling, vector works modeling, all the things I thought might be useful at my new school. To start school, I had to accept that I would have to leave my fiance, my apartment lease, and my cat in Rochester to move into my godmother's house in Bowie. I remember every moment of that choice feeling hard and wondering if I was making the right one. I thought I knew what I wanted to do, and I had to trust myself to take another risk in order to even try. It was scary, but thankfully I had an awesome professor in my first semester who encouraged me to explore the different paths of design. So shortly after starting school, I got a job at a furniture store with a classmate of mine as a showroom designer. But I also got to do in-home consultations and have my own clients. Being trusted to manage my own projects, 
getting to put my drawing skills into practice and seeing the joy brought to the people who I worked with by those projects really solidified my acceptance that design was the right career for me. While I continued at GW, I was able to think about whether residential was the only kind of design I liked. Being in DC, the main focus of our program was commercial offices. And while we had one class on residential design, there were no classes on restaurant design and no classes focused on urban design. So I took an independent study in restaurant design and based my project on a real chef in New York whose menu I liked. That was awesome. I went to New York City alone for the first time, ate at their restaurant, and came out of that experience looking at food spaces completely differently. In 2009, I had moved into my own place again in Silver Spring, and I had become obsessed with gardening. Since I spent a lot of time alone when I wasn't at school or at work, I also spent a lot of time at Target, where I bought <laughs> some garden kits from the dollar bins. I became enamored with my little plants. It reminded me of being a kid in playing with my uncle in his big vegetable garden at my grandmother's house. By the time my thesis study topic had to be chosen, I was fully into farmer's markets and maker's markets, which there were a ton of in DC. I love talking to the vendors, meeting new people, learning about their craft or their garden, and I ended up focusing my study on our sense of community, how we lost it and where to find it. In between my thesis paper and my project, I moved to a different apartment in Silver Spring. My fiance finally moved to Maryland a week before our wedding, and we got married in August of 2009. That fall, I started my final semester at GW. Everyone selected an adaptive reuse space for their thesis project, and the site selection for renovation was based on the findings of their paper. Mine was at National Park Seminary, a beautiful old campus, which was essentially a food desert. What I ended up creating in their old Greco-Roman gymnasium was a three-story community space with an indoor farmer's market, artist studios, artist residences, and a community garden. After completing that project, I knew not only what I wanted to do, but what kind of designer I wanted to be. Since then, I have worked at another furniture store, worked under a decorator, worked in data entry and computer programming, started a locally focused lifestyle magazine that I wrote, photographed for, produced, and published, moved to Baltimore, had a child, worked for an office furniture dealership, and all of which I had to accept as part of my journey to where I am right now. In 2018, I started my own studio, and while it has been 13 years since I completed my thesis project, I'm finally doing a lot of the work that I love. I have had the best clients and some of the hardest. <laughs> I have surprised myself more than once with designs that I absolutely love. And I have had so many moments of choice that came from the acceptance that I am an interior architect and a creative director, a photographer, sometimes a graphic designer, a wife, and a mother. Yeah. So when Mario asked me to speak for Creative Mornings, I immediately said no. <laughs> I explained that I don't love public speaking and I'm not a fan of being in front of cameras. Then I went home, I thought about it, and I accepted that it was something I could do and that maybe I should push myself to do. The decision to get up here and tell my story is a reflection of how I've grown to accept myself. Owning a business, taking design risks, it's all scary, and yes, I still get anxious, but I know that those feelings are normal. I'm no longer questioning whether my feelings are valid. They are. I now know myself, and going through this winding journey of a career has taught me that I can learn from my mistakes. I can grow, and my harshest critic is always myself. I've also learned that things are ever-changing in life, and also in the existence of my work. So once I decided that yes, I would get up and do something I wasn't fully comfortable with, I also knew that it had to be at Whitehall Mill. I've worked on four projects here, and they are all gone or leaving as of this week. Crust by Mac, the Urban Burger Bar, Layers the Loft, and White Tea will all officially be gone as of the 28th. And I'm incredibly grateful to have worked for the amazing businesses 
and business owners behind those brands. I'm also sad because those owners are my friends. But I know that most interior design work is one of impermanence, and acceptance is a part of that too. Thank you. You gotta stay up here for Q&A. Okay. That was good. You did it, you did it, you did it, you did it. Yay. You're good, you're good, you're good. Thank you, Tiffany. Yeah, that was relatable in so many ways, right? We're gonna start off the Q&A. So if you have a question, I'm gonna run around with this mic and get it. I'm gonna need to uh, ask that question to Tiffany. You guys see my notes? I am okay. giving my notes cards. Right. I'm not <laughs> leaving. <laughs> I don't know. I I got off the plane immediately. I was terrified. So I I wish that I had like this amazing mentor story. I have professors who have been my mentors, um, but I feel like once. I figured out that what I wanted to do didn't look a lot like what other designers I was seeing were doing. I kind of lost the ability to have design mentors, but um, in the traditional sense, I should say. So a lot of my mentors have been professionals that I work with, um, which has been really rewarding, especially since some of them are here today <laughs> and have, they've taught me a lot about you know, the type of work I want to do and the type of work that is in Baltimore and how to run a small business. Can you tell me about your dating story from here? I don't really want to hold the mic. Hey. Hi, Amanda. <laughs> That's a, that's, thank you, Amanda. <laughs> um, so we spend a lot of time asking questions, and I think for um, residential and commercial, it's the same, right? Like really getting to know your clients, really getting to know kind of the heart of what they are hoping to accomplish, because there are people who are like, oh my gosh, create a space just like this other one I've seen, and it shouldn't be someone else's space, it should be theirs. And so talking to them about their goals in the space, about how they envision using their space, about you know who's living there or working there, um, all of that goes into what we create. And um, I feel like in terms of getting imagery out of them, that's sometimes difficult. Some people are great, like you, I love working with you because you're like, ooh girl, I want this and this and this and this. And I'm like, ooh, some of those things don't go together. And then, <laughs> and then like deciding like what the space is really asking to have, right? So some of that is dictated by me, some is dictated by the client, some is dictated by the space. And I think we try to stay true to you know, not creating 
something that looks like it doesn't belong in the space it's in. So all of that plays into what we present to the clients as an idea for what they should do in their space. Hi, Cecilia. Hi, Daniel. Uh, I wanted to know, how is it, what is your uh, aesthetic journey that led you from a hookah bar or hookah line <laughs> to what happened? What was that evolution like? I think that that, so first of all, something I don't, didn't share about, but in my home, it looks, the, the public areas of my home look more like my design work. The areas that are just for me look like a hookah lounge. <laughs> they, look, <laughs> they look crazy. There's like, you know, I have like a collection of over 100 Pez dispensers that are on shelves. I have, you know, vintage tins that I collect and like all of that explodes in small spaces for me. So um, I think that for me, like overall creatively, I learned how to pare down to things that were important. And I obviously always love color, so um, I decided to kind of, instead of adding things, to add more color and to look at how to highlight different parts of the space with the color versus, you know, sticking something that like, that was, you know, I don't know, like a tapestry up somewhere where it maybe shouldn't have been, right? Because it's like adding too much to the space. Um, I also think that being in a commercial office focused design program made me pare some of those things down because we learned to do everything conceptually. So if it didn't work within the concept, it didn't belong in the space. And so that was really helpful as well for me, like just to get the notion of like, okay, it doesn't have to have everything, but like what's important? Um, I, think, I think that's probably the best answer to that question because I do still love like crazy maximalized spaces. <laughs> I just need them in small doses. I learned that I, I think I learned that like, I'm always nervous regardless, right? <laughs> um, all of the, you know, I was on my way here and I was like, I don't wanna go. <laughs> like, um, and I, I think that the more that I push myself to do things like this, the better I feel afterwards. Cause I feel like I used to feel sick to my stomach when I would get up and talk in front of people. Um, I also, with it being the length it was, there was definitely a moment in the middle where I was like, oh, I'm okay, I'm okay, I can do it. <laughs> like, but I mean, right before I was hiding out back there. So um, yeah, I think like in writing, um, what I was gonna say, I also learned to kind of like set my boundaries on what I was willing to share and what I wasn't willing to share, um, which was probably the hardest part at the beginning because I didn't really know how to, um, I mean, so Kira and Mario asked me to make my talk more personal at the beginning because it was, I had like this huge outline of like how I got to where I am business-wise and they were like, could you make it more personal? I'm like, mm, do I have to? <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, I, I just, I think I learned kind of where my boundaries are for what I'm willing to share in a bigger group versus with people that I see all the time and, and how to still make that relatable without it being just like work stuff. Your advice in 
you what advice do you give as a parent like encouraging creativity in your kid um, and to other parents who want to encourage creative kids? I don't know that I, I don't, I wouldn't say I discourage creativity. I definitely don't. Um, I think with my daughter, she is naturally creative, which is lovely. Um, I really enjoy like doing creative things with her, but also I think that growing up, there were only like a certain number of creative things my parents thought were possible and thought were things that people could get a job doing eventually or like something like that. And um, with my daughter, I just encourage her to do all kinds of things. Like if she wants to do it, let's try it, right? Like if she's interested in building a volcano, let's try it, right? She's seven, by the way, like we should not be build building real <laughs> volcano things. Um, but if she wants to do a project where we're like painting a pre-made volcano and then like doing a little bit of baking soda, that's fine. Um, as she has other interests, like for me, I encourage her to do things outside in the garden, like looking for different types of bugs or like whatever. And um, I think like, parents should just be open to letting their children kind of explore and see what they're interested in and not kind of pigeonholing them into like, this is the thing you're good at, so just do that, which I feel like is maybe what was going on with me. Um, and she's, you know, she's creative some days. She's not creative other days. She is, uh, she's a musician. She loves playing the drums, so, uh, which is what my husband does, so not, not for work. <laughs> but for, for fun. Um, and I just like to let her kind of explore all the different avenues of creativity and not, not just be like, well, this is the thing you're gonna do and that's all we're gonna do. Like, we don't have any, she goes to School of Rock and we don't have any other activities aside from like gardening and cooking and like, you know, playing right now. So yeah, that would be my advice, I don't know. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so, owning my own business has helped me with the decision fatigue. Um, I think I spend a lot of time, more, more time than people would think, not working. <laughs> so, that's probably not the right thing to say. But I, I have, a, like, just like I have boundaries um, with other things, like, I have boundaries with my work. So, if there's a day where, because, I think I'm just like trying to take advantage of the fact that I do run my own business, right? So if there's a day where like, I'm not feeling great, like not sick, but like just really don't wanna deal with people, like I kind of feel that coming on. And so I'm like, okay, I'm not gonna schedule any meetings for these days. And like maybe I'll spend the whole day in my garden. Maybe I will, you know, go to a park or like go take photos or do things that make me feel less stressed even if sometimes it's just coming to hang out at Whitehall with Brittany. <laughs> like I will make, if I feel like I do have a lot going on, that's a thing that I do a lot. So I'll like stop off and see my friends in the middle of the day if I can, or like I'll pop into Eastburn Architects and just be like, hey, what are you guys working on? Um, because I need like space from, from making decisions, from working on my projects, from my daughter and my husband and like all of these things that like are constantly going in my life. So I think what I do is generally like try to make time for myself wherever I can get it. Um, and sometimes I can't get in and sometimes I get lots of it. So it's, there's a balance, but that's my biggest, my biggest thing right now. Ooh, okay, so we have, we have 
Catalog Coffee, which is going up on the avenue. Um, it's going to be two doors away from Royal Farm, so I think that's the next thing that will be like visible to everyone else. Um, I'm also the designer for Holland's Market, and um, <laughs> um, and then we have actually like three or four residential projects that are not going to be visible to everyone until there's photographed, but um, those are really exciting for me too. Like um, Daniel is one of our residential projects going on right now. I'm excited to see his space. Um, so we, it's it's a balance of commercial and residential right now, but I think um, I'm also really excited because there's just a lot of projects that are like at various stages, and sometimes our projects last for a year. They have lasted for a year and a half before, um, but it's always like amazing scene at the end, so I think commercially, catalog is the next thing, um, and then Holland, yeah. We have one more question, and then we'll go all the way back here. Tiffany, thank you so much. Um, my name is Lily, and I was Hi. particularly um, struck by the, the beginning of your talk with talking with trauma. And I now work in a place where there's so much trauma, and we're supposed to be a place of healing and saving, which is a hospital. And yet the space itself is so That's like, that's a huge question. Um, <laughs> so, personally, I've only been a part of one project where I felt like that really was achieved. Um, I don't do a lot of institutional design, so. Um, but I worked on a project with Annie Howe, and it was for University of Maryland, and we actually took her artwork and it was printed on like a specific type of material that was safe to be in the hospital and that was also for children. Um, and I feel like bigger organizations, hospitals especially, who are catering to people who maybe, who definitely need like the mental health of, you know, being in the space, um, they need to do more of that, right? Like they need to do more thinking about making spaces beautiful, especially when there's so many people who are stuck in the hospital or have to come back to the hospital all the time. Um, and just putting a bigger emphasis on, um, on bringing art into the space or bringing you know, better lighting into the space or just anything that's not gonna give you that like enclosed, I don't wanna be here feeling, right? So I think that that starts on you know, a much higher level. By the time it gets to me, it's like, oh, this is amazing. I can't believe they're doing this. But I just wish that, um, I guess the people in charge of hospitals saw it that way. I don't, I think that that's the most important thing is that like, why can't a hospital look like this, right? Like I know why it can't have exposed brick, but I don't know why it can't feel, you know, I feel like this is a fairly sterile space in terms of like materials. So, um, I feel like they should do more of that and just, you know, if you have to cover it in plexi or whatever, like that's fine, but it could be beautiful. <laughs>